Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Zoom conversation with Alex Sof. A very warm and special welcome to Alec himself, uh, joining us from abroad. I'm sitting here in Foam in Amsterdam. And my name is Hinde Haas, and I had the privilege of working together with Alec on his new solo exhibition uh, called I Know How Furiously Your Heart Is Beating after the same series, his most recent series. Um, this is the first uh, museum presentation of the work and Alec will be shedding some lights uh, for about just under an hour uh, on this new work. Uh, so welcome again. I'm so happy we are still able to do this despite um, you know, the COVID-19 measures that are in place. I have some practical announcements first for all the uh, people who joined us. There, you are all muted. But if you have questions, uh, we would love to hear them. So please share them in the chat function. And after the conversation, there will be some time um, to answer your questions. Perhaps not all of them, but a selection. Um, then I should inform you that the talk is being recorded, uh, just so that you are aware, so that we can share it at a later stage as well. Um, and lastly, I would like, this event is free, of course, um, but you will be able to donate uh, uh, some of your own choosing uh, to join this event in uh, a link that will be shared in the chat function shortly. Um, so feel free. Uh, well, before I give the floor to Alec, I would like to give you a short visual impression of the exhibition that opened last week on Thursday. A very quiet opening, unfortunately, but still uh, uh, we are happy to be open again and be able to show this work. Um, I will walk you through the exhibition and I think it'd be nice um, to do that, sort of talking um, to Alec about it. Um, the works, are mostly portraiture, um, but also a lot of still lives um, of interiors of people's personal belongings. Um, very contemplative, very quiet images um, that to me, but Alec, maybe you have um, something to say about this too that I look through a very different lens um, after everything that's happened. I mean, the show, the series was conceived before um, the Corona crisis happened. Um, it was planned to open um, before, but of course we had to uh, postpone the opening. And it was, it opened right in the middle of a pandemic. So to me, these images have, gained a whole new sort of meaning or a new perspective. Um, they are very intimate. They are taken in people's homes, uh, which, you know, uh, having experienced confinement, most of us uh, might resonate very differently now. Um, they are about um, connecting with, with another person, but also feeling a sense of distance. Um, that again, I think we might have all experienced uh, in the past few months. So Alec, my first question to you is, you know, looking back on your work and also on the past few months and the process of making this exhibition for Foam is, you know, how, how do you look back on your own series? Do you see it in a different light uh, given recent events? I mean, absolutely. I see everything in a different light. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's really pretty staggering. Um, but first of all, I mean, just as a start, I want to thank you um, and your curation of this. Uh, I, I always talk about how when I make work, I, I tend to think about the book form first, you know, so um, I, I'm here in Minnesota. Uh, you know, we have a couple of museums, a couple of galleries, but it's like the way I fundamentally 
get my photographic information most of the time is through book form. So I, I kind of understand that form. Um, but exhibitions are so different. And I've, I have learned uh, that I really need the help of, of curators and institutions and people that understand their own space. Um, because one thing about the form of a book is that it's controllable. Uh, but an exhibition space is always different. It's always varied. Um, and it was interesting putting, you know, putting this show together uh, versus shows I've done in the past because, uh, I mean, fortunately, now we have these new tools like Google SketchUp where you can, you can really become familiar with the space before ever going there. Um, and, and it used to not be that way. You used to have to make like 3D models of spaces, but it was really not very, you couldn't get the feeling of stepping inside of it. So now there's that. Uh, but I still really rely uh, on the help of curators. And, and then normally you, you then hang the exhibition and you still make changes. Um, and in this case, I had to, had to trust you and, um, and I'm, you know, I, I have not walked into the space, <laughs> but, it, uh, but it sure looks great. And there's this, uh, I mean, one of the main things that I've wanted was this work is all interiors, but I wanted this airiness. I wanted this, this quality of openness. Um, and, and it looks to really have that. So, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of how things have changed, I mean, I was gonna, when was this ske originally scheduled this exhibition? I can't even remember now. Um, I forget. I think it was like yeah. May or something. <laughs> I think it was, we, we, we were closed for about three months. Yeah, uh, must have been three months. Maybe, oh yeah, maybe it was June. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, so much has transpired, and I, you know, and and of course we didn't even know if it was ever going to open. Um, and sadly, uh, you know, I'm I'm not able to leave the country now, as far as I can tell. Um, so, you know, my I think my work has always dealt with. Uh, you know, really those words, social distance. I didn't know that term before. <laughs> and, and then it emerged and I was like, wow, everyone's speaking my language. Um, and I, and I joke, you know, I, I would joke that it, it felt like everyone was invited to my party. And, and now there's like, you know, 500 people sitting here <laughs> in solitude. Um, it's, it's pretty staggering. Uh, that said, I'm not, uh, I'm not feeling great about it because it's like, it's, it's one thing when you choose solitude and it's, it's a very different thing when it's mandated. Yeah, true. But it's also, I mean, in your work, you see a continuing effort to overcome, you know, this social distancing, mm -hmm. um, which I think, I mean, if you look at the current situation and what we are doing here in this online space is really, reconnecting in a different way um, to each other, um, despite all odds. And I think that's also what your new series is trying to do in a different way from, um, from your previous work. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this, you know, this, the, the, the title of this talk is slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about uh, a sort of collective slowing down that we're experiencing right now. But as I understood it, also for you, a very personal experience of slowing down your working process, um, which in fact was, you know, the product of, I think, a years long, well, relative inactivity where you, mm. even before, you know, uh, Corona uh, came, yeah. you stopped traveling uh, of your own account and you hardly photographed people anymore, you said. Mm -hmm. um, so you were already in this process of, of redefining, I guess, maybe your relationship to, as a photographer to your subject. And I was wondering if you could tell a bit more about that period sort of preceding this series and what trends. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and should I, should I throw, should we share my screen now? Yeah. So we get to my images. Got my screen share. Hold on. So I go, I hit, Share screen. 
I go like this. Uh, uh, is that my screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually going to start off with this picture uh, instead, and you, you have no idea why you're looking at this, but I'll but I'll explain. So uh, yeah, I mean, as you said, I I, uh, I took off a year from photographing. Um, there's a long backstory about that, and I don't really need to go into it, but I just decided uh, I need to get, you know, I need to get away from photography. It wasn't a negative thing, but I was, um, I was just sort of rethinking my relationship to the world. And, and I was concerned about uh, the ethics of photography and the ethics of portraiture. And, uh, and I just wasn't sure about the value of it. Um, in large part because I've always seen uh, my practice as being about social distance, about separation, about disconnection. And, and I feared that my photography was almost like an advertisement for separation. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I didn't know that that's what I wanted to put out into the world. Uh, and a year went by and, um, and I started to, to think less dualistically uh, about things. And, and I thought, well, maybe I should attempt to make portraits in a different way. And, and that's where this room comes in. Uh, so this is a, a, it's a gallery space. Uh, it was called the, the Frankel Lab. It's no longer uh, around, but it was my, my San Francisco gallery, Frankel Gallery, had this experimental space. And I said, I would like to use this space as a way to see if I can uh, interact with people in a new way. And, and my idea was uh, that early in the morning, I would be in this space. And, and if you see that funny chair on the lower right, the way this worked is I would sit in that chair and I would be meditating. And, uh, and then a person, so only one person at a scheduled appointment time would come in the room and I would have my eyes closed for 10 minutes while they went around the room, they could hang out, there were some books, whatever. Um, so they be could become comfortable in the space. And they were told that after 10 minutes, I would open my eyes. Um, we weren't gonna talk to each other but we were gonna interact with each other. Um, and what does that mean, interact? <laughs> it could be anything. Uh, there were also cameras in there, so I could take pictures, the other person could take pictures. We could play on the seesaw or teeter-totter. I don't know what your terminology is. Uh, so many countries represented here, but... Um, or uh, you know, we could just stare at each other, or we could sit in other ends of the room and and be with each other, and and this was a, a really powerful experience. Um, the thing about it is that I didn't choose the people who I interacted with. Uh, a, a choreographer found half the people, and the gallery found the other half, and and each encounter was totally different and totally beautiful. The thing about it is that there's not really meaningful artwork to be shared about this experience because it was a one-on-one -on -one physical experience in this space, uh, which is fine, uh, uh, but it's, so it wasn't really photographic. But then something happened. So the, uh, the, the choreographer who was choosing half of the subjects for me to encounter had chosen the, the pretty legendary choreographer, very legendary choreographer, Anna Halperin. And she was, I think, 97 years old at the time and too frail to come down to the gallery. Um, so he told me about this separately and because uh, he was a mentor of, of his, and she was a mentor of his. And so I went and, and visited her home. And, uh, 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 uh oh, uh oh. And that's where I made this picture here. Um, and so this, this photograph was made 
in the same way that I, I've always made pictures. Uh, I, I was talking with her, we were interacting, she took me around her home. Um, and then uh, eventually I made this photograph from outside the window looking in. Um, so one, one thing you'll notice about it, which is kind of interesting is that this, this long bench that she's sitting on is somewhat like a seesaw. <laughs> so she's at one end and I'm at the other. And this became my, my metaphor for photographic portraiture. Um, where there's two people uh, looking at each other and, and there's, there's an exchange of, of, of energy. That can be an exchange of power. Um, that can be an exchange in different sort of ways. There's separation, but there's also, we're connected by a certain kind of energy. So I sort of became less dualistic. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a portrait and it's, it's both separate and connected. That's the way I started thinking about portraiture. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I love this feeling. And I just want to explore portraiture again at its, at its most fundamental, I guess. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm ready to like be a photographer. And, and I thought, well, how am I going to go forward with this? And, and so I thought, I don't want to do a project. I don't, uh, don't want to like uh, put it in a big container. And so I thought, I'm just going to do individual portraits. And, and I don't want it to be location-based. I don't want it to be about the USA or what have you. Um, so basically, I, I decided I'm just going to do portraits wherever I happen to travel for whatever reason. Um, and so for example, I'm gonna, oops, sorry about that. So uh, I, I was in Berlin for something and, and I reached out to a couple people I knew and I said, uh, hey, I'm looking, <laughs> like, I'm looking to interact with another human being in their space uh, and of course they would say, well, what sort of human being? And I, and I would say, well, I don't really know exactly, but I know uh, that I, I, I took this photograph of a dancer and there's something about the way a dancer understands space. And they, they understand the relationship between bodies and people in space. And this is interesting to me. And I, and I, and I think I have something to learn here. I don't wanna do a, a series of portraits of dancers but, I, uh, but that's one possibility. And so this was a real early picture. And, and this, uh, this woman, Yuko in Berlin, uh, this is her apartment. And, and, and she is a, a, a dancer and, and uh, performance artist and what have you. So she has that, that kind of physicality. Um, I'll tell you something. I'm just rambling here, so forgive me. <laughs> well, may I ask a question? Because, yeah. um, of course, um, yeah, there are pictures of dancers uh, in the series, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. a lot, uh, mm -hmm. for the reason you just mentioned. But then there's, and I mean, there are some quite well-known individuals like Anna, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also people that you just met along the way, right? That are not necessarily um, either dancers or well-known. So what's the common denominator? in a way there, of, there is none no there really was not a common denominator and that that was the thing is that i didn't you know so with that seesaw project they were all strangers they were all picked for me in this case i thought well if if there's someone i want to photograph that's a friend i can do that if it, uh it and if it's a total stranger that i just happen upon i'm still allowed to do that there are no rules to it uh I just thought I will feel this out. But the one thing that was very different about this was that I sorted out all of the, the kind of uh, negotiation beforehand. So that uh, a friend in Berlin, you know, recommended Yuko here and put me in touch. And so via email, I said, oh, I'm coming to Berlin. And, and, and then I could explain who I am, what I'm doing, 
and the fact that there's a possibility this could end up on a museum wall someday. And there's a possibility that it could be in a book and I will send you a print. And we could figure out all of that stuff so that once I arrived, it's more like a painting session and we can just, you know, we can just be in that space together. Are, are crazy yellow streaks going across the screen for you? Because they are for me. Yeah, see, they are. I, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if someone's drawing on the picture. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think that's me. Uh, but for you, what was the difference in, I mean, you photographed, for example, Vince Aletti, I think he's a friend yeah. of yours, and you have a working relationship uh, with him, uh, as opposed to, I don't know, Yuko, who you just met. Is that important? In, in that moment? Uh, I, that's the thing is that I really, in my, in my mind, especially in the beginning of the pro, the beginning of the project, it wasn't a project. So it was, I was trying to get away from that. And I was, I was trying to think like, oh, I'm gonna make a portrait of this today. <laughs> and, and just treat it individually. Now about halfway through that all changed and I, I started like, you know, doing what I inevitably do, which is putting, you know, putting it in a container and turning it into a book and all of that. But I, but I tried to limit the amount that I did that. But I think I can show you if I go to the next slide. So this is a, this is a picture that no one's seen before. I just uh, grabbed this yesterday. Um, but it's a good example, I think, because um, her name, her name's Uta and uh, this is in um, Odessa. And I was in Odessa for a photo festival. And, and again, I, uh, I, so I reached out to someone and, and asked them to put me in touch with different people. Uh, and sometimes what would happen is that the person who's putting me in touch knows my photography and they kind of know the people that I sort of typically like to photograph. And so they would find people like that, which is not necessarily what I was looking for. Uh, but I think, I mean, I think my work uh, is not only about a kind of social distance, but a social awkwardness. And so sometimes I would, be, I would meet up with people with social awkwardness as well. And that's great. Uh, but, but in this case, and, and, and she, you know, she was really fantastic and interesting character, but the picture wasn't working for me as well. Uh, but it was fine. I'm, and I didn't care. That was the other thing about this, this way of working is that I was really trying to downplay the, the sort of aggressiveness, the need to like get something. And if it wasn't happening, it wasn't happening and that's okay. Um, but, but I also started just looking around and if, if there was something interesting in the home, that was good too. And I, I really developed this idea that I had this, the one limitation was that I was inside always. Um, and so I would make an interior. So uh, Uta in a different room had this bookshelf and, and it was just so beautiful. Um, and it was really high up and, and you can see that green book sitting on the top of the shelf. Um, and, and it was just an extraordinary thing. And there was no reason to try to figure out a way to put her in front of this or what have you. I just, I just wanted this. And, it, and in a way it was, uh, it was a portrait of her as well. Um, and so I allowed for that. And that also gave more space uh, within the pictures as well. Because um, I just didn't want to be like person, person, person. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, in the book that becomes really very clear uh, as well as in the exhibition that you, you know, you have these still lives that are almost like a, a, a space or an interfunction um, in, a, in a narrative that is inevitably created, even though, you know, you, you weren't looking for a specific type of individual, there is no geographical or demographic um, sort of common denominator. Mm -hmm. um, I think inevitably, if you put pictures together, they will start speaking to each other. Uh, and in this case, I found it really um, telling that you named the series after a poem. Because to me, these sort of empty spaces in between the pictures, um, leaving out information, uh, suggest, uh, uh, yeah, making a suggestion instead of telling a story, 
which is mm -hmm. to me what you are trying to do in this series, um, mm -hmm. is more like, reads more like poetry than prose. And uh, that's, I mean, you named the series after a poem by Wallace Stevens mm -hmm. called The Bray Room. Perhaps you can talk about that um, a bit more. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I have the slide of that poem here. Um, and, and what the, I mean, I, I'm not going to read the poem because that it's going to be sound really pretentious. Um, but, but just the last line. Yeah, well, really, but I, it's important to explain what the poem is. So it's, first of all, it's titled The Gray Room. So it's just like, it's just a room. Um, it's, it's like any one of these rooms that I'm looking at right now on the screen. And, and there's another person in this room. But then Stevens, you know, shows that it's not a gray room. That it's any, there's all this color with, you know, it says, although you sit in a room that is gray, except for the silver and the, and the pale white gown and the green beads and the green fan and the red branches, you know, there's everywhere, there's color, there's beauty. And he's like taking in all of this sumptuous detail. Um, and then there's this person, this woman, and, and he's taking her in as well, but he, you know, it, her heart is beating, but he can't, he's, he can't know more. It's just, it's, it's on the surface of things. Um, I really think that while well, Stevens, I always think of him as the poet of, you know, the ultimate poet of consciousness, of this, of, of the separation that comes from consciousness, but, but he really has that dualistic understanding that it's separation, but it's also a connection and, and there's real beauty in that. Um, so a picture, uh, um, sorry, like this, uh, you know, is very connected to that poem. Uh, so this is uh, Renata, this is in Bucharest, Romania. And, and, and again, this was a situation of of someone finding subjects for me, and uh, and and for whatever reason, I I ended up in that particular year being invited to Eastern Europe a lot, um, and and kind of former former Soviet countries, and um, and often was finding myself in these big apartment buildings, little small apartments and big apartment buildings, um, and. And so here she is in this room, just, just full of color. Um, and, and, and it was a really, this was a particularly interesting portrait session because she is someone, it, it turns out that she has a, a long experience as a meditator. Um, and so she meditated uh, for a long time and I just, I, I just watched her. So that was that. You know, I could like, she's barely moving, but you know, there's a heartbeat. Um, and I could, we could just be in that space together. Uh, when I finally made this picture, I think it's worth noting uh, just for the camera geeks out there that I didn't use lighting and, and it was really dark in there. Um, and I'm using a large format camera. So she has to hold really, really still. I, um, and the plane of focus is incredibly narrow, um, but you're able to, you know, move your eye, upper arm, you can read the, the, the tattoo, you can see her scars, and you can move your eye up to the iPhone that's sitting on the couch with those plugs. You're taking in all this detail. Um, and there's this person who, we don't know anything about her. We don't know what her dreams are. We don't know what her history is, who her parents were. Um, so we have to just accept a certain amount of distance. That's to me what the work was about. Yeah, because that's, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, you've had this personal experience with um, the sitter in the room, you know, uh, in the beginning with the seesaw, but later as you were photographing, spending uh, a lot of time uh, with each model in their private sphere, which mm -hmm. is really different, I guess. It's photographing from the inside in instead of from the outside in. Um, but then of course you have to sort of, 
let go of the work and let the visitor of a museum or the buyer of a book or you know people who are in this conversation um, engage with the picture in their own way um, not having had that sort of connecting experience if you know what i mean yeah so there it becomes difficult because you're yeah i mean your personal experience and getting to know this person needs to somehow translate it to to another audience you know mm -hmm. outside of you um well one of the things about an exhibition and the reason i love exhibitions is when you have the, the physicality of a of a larger print you there something happens <laughs> it's when you when you're with another person um even though it's a photograph when they when it's near the size um there's a different kind of you can feel that energy in a different sort of way and and it's kind of a relief too because they're not actually <laughs> you know conscious um uh, I mean, we, you know, I, I was sitting here thinking, should I do a little experiment and the, you know, we'll go full screen, the two of us, and we'll just stare at each other for five minutes. And not only would you and I feel that intensity, everyone watching would feel that. Um, they would feel uncomfortable, but they would look very closely. They would look at the flowers behind you, the books behind me, they would take in everything. And, and we're all doing this. We're analyzing who the other person is. Like Abramovich. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, piece. yeah, but also the the material in the room is you know we're analyzing, we're like trying to understand each other, and that's really like the exhibition part of this or the book part of this is slowing down, giving a space so that you can have that kind of inquiry and allow for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm interested in, um, can you, if you can go back to the picture of Anna, um, photographing through the glass window. I mm -hmm. mean, you've talked about um, the glass in the lens as being either an yeah. obstacle or a point of entry into somebody else's world. Um, but I see in the series as well, a lot of um, photographing through glass, uh, even also, I think, double exposure uh, mm -hmm. that you that you did um, yeah. but also a lot of other tropes like you know doors windows points of point of uh, seclusion but also points of entry um, yeah. so yeah i was wondering if you could uh, talk a bit more about this sort of clear motive in in the series yeah um well one thing i i i, I think about a lot i've always thought about a lot is the curator john sarkowski who who had this famous exhibition called uh, Mirrors and Windows. And he broke down, um, he broke down the, the, the world of photography into two groups. They're like mirror photographers and window photographers. And, and, that, and that, that speaks to this issue that I had, like, it, am I just being, you know, am I taking advantage of people? Am I doing a cruel act of, uh, you know, propag propaganda in the name of separation when I make work? And, and, I, and I started thinking, no, it's, it's, it's both a mirror and a window. I mean, every window is also a mirror. <laughs> it reflects upon yourself. And, and, that's what I, and that's what I loved about this picture. I'm looking in, but I'm also looking out. We're seeing the outside world, we're seeing the inside world. She has plants living in her inside world as well. So that there is like this idea of inside and outside is actually an abstraction um and and just sort of accepting that there's separation and connection um that's and 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 i should say that it's not like i meditated with every person i photographed sometimes there was a totally different kind of energy and and i allowed for that too so sometimes there are some pictures where i'm pulled back very far and and others where there's like a sexual energy or what have you and it, and that's okay and i let it i let it all be um yeah i think what strikes me in this image as well as some others is that there is a sense of if i can say so voyeurism because you're looking through a window or you're sure. looking through a door or through a creek in the, mm -hmm. in the window but then um 
it's not because this person is looking straight at you and you have a very obvious um, yeah. interaction going on. And I think as a viewer, when you stand in front of the picture, as you say, at you know, large scale, you really sense this as well. It has this duality of not yeah. being able to approach or to enter, but not being, uh, not being voyeuristic. Either. Yeah, or it's, or it's voyeuristic and, and also not voyeuristic <laughs> at once. And that's- Because they're of, looking back. And yeah. They're looking at you. But that's kind of like, you know, I've done, uh, I did an interview, re, you know, pretty recently uh, in, in advance of this exhibition. Um, and the interviewers, you know, smartly said like, these pictures aren't really that different than your other pictures. And I was like, I know. It's just that it's like a little bit different. It's just a little bit more open, a little bit softer. Um, and, and a lot of it's in my head, this, this difference. Um, and, I, and I'll be honest with you right now, like I'm in a, I'm in a different state of mind. So I, I could look at the same picture on another day and see it as a picture of separation. <laughs> so it really depends on my own psychological state. Uh, and and if, if I could, if you don't mind me, I'm just going to go forward here to this, which, which really, oops, uh, which really speaks to that. Um, and, and this is so late in the, in the project, I, 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 I was thinking about this and I was thinking about wow, all these people are like birds in bird cages. <laughs> and, and we talk about open windows and with like, uh, you know, you can really see through the bird cage. You can touch the <laughs> the little bird, uh, but they're in an enclosure. Uh, and I wanted uh, birds in the pictures, and uh, and so I like I put a I was going to Utah for a lecture, and I I put a call out on social media to see if anyone had a bird I could photograph. And and this is this wonderful Mormon family uh, that that allowed me into their home and. Um, I mean, this was nothing was staged here. Those Mormon books were there, um, and and it, and it, it, so the, so it all has to do with uh, yeah, with windows, with connection, not having connection, wanting to be outside, not being able to, which is so weirdly connected to the time that we're living in, um, and maybe. You know, before we go Q and A, uh, if if it's okay, if I can just uh, because probably someone is would ask, what are you working on now in this time of <laughs> uh, the pandemic and and being locked down? Um, and I found that I couldn't photograph. Uh, that I, I mean, I did little experiments, but nothing was working. Um, and it was really so different. Uh, again, because I was able, when I was working on this, I was choosing to look at that. Here it was being kind of thrust upon me in a way I didn't want. Um, and this, this crazy thing happened, which is that uh, before the, the pandemic in January, a, uh, a, a man in prison uh, named C. Fausto Cabrera, uh, he's, a, he's in a prison here in Minnesota, uh, he's, he's a writer and, uh, and an artist, and, and he wrote to me uh, because he, was, he had been transferred to another prison that didn't have very good library and facilities, and he was really hungry for creative interaction. And, and, and so he and I started writing together. And then uh, the quarantine happened, uh, and it took on this whole new meaning. I mean, here's a guy, he's been in prison for 17 years, and connecting with the outside world through uh, letters or you know, 15 minute phone calls that immediately get shut off when you're talking. Uh, and so he and I started having a very deep conversation about human connection. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I live in Minneapolis, murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, we talked about that. Um, and it's just been this unbelievable way of connecting with another human being who I've never laid eyes on. I mean, I've never, I was rejected uh, to, to visit him for idiotic reasons. Uh, 
And, and this is the thing that I've done this year and I'm, and I'm really proud of. And, and I just want to show you that um, we're now publishing this dialogue in letters in book form and with all proceeds going to the Minnesota uh, Prison Writers Workshop. And, uh, and again, it's, it's just another way at getting at human connection or disconnection. Yeah, I think it's very telling that this is through text. I mean, you are an avid blogger and you share, you write a lot. Uh, you share your writings on Little Brown Mushroom as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my last question would be in a time where, you know, contextualizing an image becomes more and more important because of the reasons you, you just mentioned. I mean, representation is, is power. Um, yeah. How, I mean, I see that you're using text and image together um, to do this. And uh, if you can elaborate a little bit more about, you know, the function of text in your practice uh, in sort of contextualizing your work. Yeah. I, uh... I mean, you give, it seems that you're giving full disclosure also online about your personal process and, you know, resist mythologizing of your own images by giving openness uh, about the, how they came about and yeah uh uh, uh uh how to talk i mean first on the image text thing um uh, this is like the great wrestling match of my entire artistic career um is trying to figure out ways text does and does not work with with photographs and this little brown mushroom, which some of you might know is like, we used to publish books and done workshops and all sorts of things, um, was always about experimenting with text and image. Um, but in the end, you know, uh, they're different things also. And, and, and with the, the Furiously work, I really, I really wanted it to exist outside of text for the most part. Um, but, you know, I am like constantly learning and evolving and, and, and thinking about all of that stuff and, and of course the ethics and, um, and what have you, and we can get into that or not, or what, as you wish. <laughs> um, I think I'll uh, open it up to yes. the audience. I received some questions. Raise yourself. <laughs> um, shall I name the names? Yeah. Um, Gunter Chaos, usually you approach or build up your work from a set or a sequence of photographs that represent a narrative. But with I know how furiously your heart is beating, you've let go of that principle and you focus more on a single image instead. Is, is this something that you will continue to hang on to or was this a one-time thing? Uh, I can't, it's really hard to speak to the future. So you know, when we talked about my year away from photography, it wasn't a year away. It was like, I think I'm done as a photographer. <laughs> I thought uh, I was, I, I thought I was going to interact with the world in a different way. And then I came back to photography. Um, I thought I would never do editorial, you know, magazine photography or what have, what, what have you again. Um, and I came back to that. And I mean, currently, I never want to do editorial photography again, but I may come back to it. Uh, so I have no, I, I don't know. I mean, the one thing I, you know, that's so great about being an artist is you can change and you can grow and you can shift gears. And, and if I've wanted anything from my career, it's the freedom to do that, to, you know, I always think like a filmmaker, I, you know, I want to be able to make a feature film and then a documentary and then an experimental move short and then something else. And I don't want to be boxed in. Next question from Florian van Ruckel. Alec, you said in an interview that you now feel that everything is connected. Can you elaborate on what kind of things you didn't know were co connected before? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is, so now we're getting to the real, uh, 
uh, like woo woo part of this conversation. I don't know if woo woo translates, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I mean, I had an experience, you know, I had an experience meditating where uh, the, the, the kind of barriers of consciousness fell away for a period of time. And I realized, and I think many people have experienced this, you know, through psychedelics or through, you know, dream states or what have you, but where you realize that, oh, like color doesn't exist. <laughs> it's, it's, it's happening in my brain or even time doesn't actually exist. It's something that we experience. Uh, and, and when you have those moments where it falls away, you just realize that, yeah, that all of this, uh, that so many of the concerns and so many of the ways that we're looking at things are uh, mistaken. But you can't live in that state <laughs> at all times. And so, uh, so I now, you know, I now exist uh, with the knowledge that everything is connected, that, uh, you know, and, and we can see this so that if, uh, if, if a, you know, if a man is murdered in Minneapolis, it's possible that the entire world will have a revolution uh, through connection. Because, or if a flu breaks out in China, that the whole world can change. Uh, th things are connected in unseen ways. And I have an intellectual understanding of that, but I don't walk around, uh, you know, as though it's connected. Whew, that's a heavy <laughs> question. But I think, I mean, photography has a large part to play in this because it's has been for the past months, the primary medium through which we are connected and through it's, which it's, we it's connect. Really, it's really ironic, isn't it? I mean, it's because, uh, yes, I mean, social, you know, social media, all this stuff, and we, we complain uh, in a valid way about how much it separates us, but it is actually this, this medium in which we're connecting like right now. And in fact, there are people, you know, around the world sitting here connecting, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Speaking of connection, I've been asked if you can stop your screen share. Oh, if I'm you're comfortable with that. Yes, I'm, uh, before we go to the next question. There we go. Great. Thanks. Um, from Sis Dan, Alec, two questions. How would you approach intimacy in photography in the age of COVID-19? And second, how do you make sense of a chaotic photographic archive in order to create an, a comprehensive project, stru structurally talking? Do you need me to repeat? Uh, I don't, so, so for the first question, I don't have an answer. Uh, I've really struggled like hell and have not done anything in photography this year that's been uh, worthwhile. So no answers, good luck on your solutions. Um, can I, let, about the second question, let me show you something, just one second. I don't know if you can see this, but this is like, these are all photographs. This is like, I don't know, I think this is like, 20 pounds of photographs and uh, I've been buying photographs by the pound uh, so I, I think I have like 60 pounds of them and what does it mean like what do all these photographs mean how on earth can they be assembled in a meaningful way and you know when we talk about like the, the age that we're living in with just being bombarded. Uh, and, and I think, I think we can find meaning. And I think it's usually through storytelling that that happens, ironically, because we were talking about how uh, this series was supposed to exist without a story. But what have we talked about here? We talked about my meditation, we talked about seesaws, we talked about an experience I had in a room with a certain person. So we do connect through stories. And that's most of these books behind me. Uh, when I refer to it, 
I don't just refer to pictures, I refer to some sort of story about it. Now remember your, um, the tour of your bookshelves uh, uh -huh. for a Mac? and you pulled out a photo album with vernacular uh, images, I guess mm -hmm. much like the one you just um, showed yeah. us. And I was wondering if you, I mean, do you use that principle maybe in this new series in a new way where you kind of connect individual images that have no... Yeah, I, I, th yeah, I think there is an, an element of that. Uh, if I can just reference that same interview, because it was just a really great interview, and I was asked, uh, or, or the writer had the idea that it's almost like I've created a family album with all of these strangers. <laughs> and though it, it, like I was creating my own personal family album. Um, I thought that was quite interesting. Can I go to how many more questions should we do? Two? Um, one more. You have mentioned, or sorry, from 91. You have mentioned a couple of times your concerns with regard of the ethics of portraiture. Where do your concerns lie? Uh, so, I've never been a photographer and I'm still not that thinks when I take a picture, I'm doing good for the world. <laughs> uh, I generally, and, and even when I'm photographing someone with full consent, I usually feel like I'm wasting their time and, uh, and irritating them a little. I always feel a little guilty taking pictures. And, and the way I came to think of it was that it, it was like, it was a, you know, I wasn't doing good, but it wasn't a criminal act. You know, it wasn't a terrible crime. It was sort of like eating meat, <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, you know, I do this, this is my, you know, but I'm not, I don't, I didn't think it was criminal. Um, but then for a period of time, I, I was like, oh yeah, I don't need to eat meat and I don't need to photograph people. Uh, and I thought that's, that's fine. I'm doing less damage <laughs> in some ways. Um, and, and so, you know, now, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure many of you know, I've been embroiled in a recent, you know, controversy uh, about photographing people and, and it was heartbreaking because, uh, because there it is again. Uh, you know, if I photograph a person uh, and, and it's being used to represent something or it's, uh, and it's being, yeah, depending on the context in which it's shown, uh, that can potentially be hurtful to people. And that, that really bothers me. Um, so I don't know. I don't have a good answer. But there's also a difference between working for an editorial and doing your own series, which I think in this case is irrelevant. There, there is, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's like, it's the difference between, yeah, eating like, uh, you know, farm grad beef and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> something from a manufacturing plant, but I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that it's perfectly healthy. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a great answer for that. Working on it like everyone else. Um, I have a last question from the audience, uh, which relates to this. It's a tough one by Gianfranco Suito. Um, how do you feel individuals who are outside mainstream culture um, can be included in the conversation around human connection? I'm sorry, say, can you repeat it, sorry. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel individuals who are outside of mainstream culture, um, sorry, can be included in the conversation around human connection? Boy. Uh... 
it's kind of, it's a hard it's a hard question to answer only because it's sort of I would want to have a conversation with the person asking the question about what that means because I'm not it it could mean any number of things. Uh, I hate to end on this like a. <laughs> Uh, I really want to be honest and open, but I'm not, I don't know that I entirely understand the question. Uh, okay. um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, maybe we can end with a, a last a different <laughs> one. Um, sorry, my colleague is telling me something. Okay. Jana Raikova. Dear Alex, speaking of looking outside and wanting to go out, could you elaborate on how could your photography look like uh, if you were looking inside or wanting to go or be inside? I'm not sure I understand this question. I mean, maybe it's like looking at myself, right? Is Sorry? That, I, I mean, one thing I think a lot about is looking at oneself. Um, so mm -hmm. on a recent trip, let me just grab it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I just had it. Oh, shoot. Uh, where is it? Oh, I've lost it. Anyway, I was just looking at uh, Francesca Woodman's book, and and I I'm fascinated by Francesca Woodman uh, because you know she was a photographer looking at herself, and so many young artists are are fascinated by her work. Um, by looking inward. And it's really like in that mirror window duality, it's very mirrorish. Um, and, you know, and I've often thought like, what would that be like? I can't imagine doing it. Uh, and I, what I really try to do is look, I try to go out in the world as a way of looking inside myself. At, I've done things that have come closer to more pure inward looking and it ends up being i feel overexposed and uh self-indulgent essentially so because i have i'm very introverted very inward looking naturally uh so i i tend to do that no matter where i go it reminds me of your uh, you made an image of nancy uh rexroth for your yes. series as well yeah. which is also a very sort of you know introspective series right it's about memory it's about nostalgia it's about uh her own youth and then you you know choosing i guess or somebody choosing for you uh her as a model for this series and also you wrote i think an introduction to the publication yes, exactly <laughs> yeah, like you planned it <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Nancy Rexroth is a very much an interior, I mean, she is definitely, like Francesca Woodman, an interior photographer, even though she didn't much photograph herself, although she did here. Um, and and I, I, I connected with her in that way. I had never met her, uh, but I used, I used this time period as an opportunity to meet her and and we bonded deeply in our like social awkwardness, I guess. And I'm really proud of that picture. I love it so much um, because it's, it's, to me, it's one of the most intimate pictures I've ever made. Um, and yeah, and that's, and that's where photography can be so surprising. And in fact, for her, I mean, maybe I'll, this is a good way of ending things on a positive note. That portrait was really meaningful to her and it was really, she felt seen in a good way. And, uh, and I felt connected to her in a good way. And, and so maybe photography can do good. <laughs> the end. <laughs> All right, I like this ending. Um, thanks, Alec, a lot for making the time um, to speak to us. Uh, thank you, everybody who's stuck around for your time and your attention and your presence. If you liked the event, you can, if you want, make a donation uh, under the link that is going to be shared under the chat. Uh, and please, if you can, uh, do come and see the exhibition. 
and of course the book uh, of the series. Um, and well, we hope to see you again in real physical space soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.